there. Good to see you again. Last time I saw you, an angry young man. Uh, you're slightly older now, but mm. oh yeah, still angry. Well, I was just seeing the world's just going, marching backwards faster all the time. You know, everything I read is bad news, apart from the Sandinista uh, thing in Nicaragua. Everything is bad news. Everything's marching backwards. You know, in this country that we. Re return to Victorian Victorian ideals, you know, that's the the government message. Who wants to go back there? And the Americans are going back to the American way of life which never existed in the first place, you know. The Bible network. Huh? The Bible network. Yeah, the Bible belt and all that stuff and everything's going backwards to something that doesn't really exist, you know, when really the supposedly the technology and science was gonna save the world and we should be going forwards to a bright future and all that you know it's like recession close a factory down throw people out of work instead of invent something or manufacture something that the rest of the world wants to buy the world's going backwards and you know just I can't stand to go backwards because I feel I'm going forwards hmm so basically what you could be saying indirectly is like the songs you've wrote which were more or less an attack on these things didn't have that too much of a of a powerful no uh, of course not you know I, I know the relative size compared to the Pentagon mm -hmm. say the clash compared to the Pentagon yeah, is like smaller than the, the flea on a flea or on an elephant mm -hmm. it's that small even smaller than that so I know but our effect is unmeasurable I don't mean in its immensity I mean in its you can't tell it, find it, or speak <coughs> of it, really. You know, I know it's out there because I get letters here, letters there. I talk to a lot of people, a lot of people, and I know our, what effect we have. I know that, I know that we change people's minds and we change directions of people's lives, even. So I know that the clash is is doing something, but without any help or support from other groups. What I'm talking about chiefly is that they go for the buck shot. I mean, they go for the, here's a quick way to make a lot of money, take offered, and a lot of groups are taking that. And that doesn't get us anywhere. I'm talking about preventing the world going backwards, finding a decent economic order where the poor are taken care of, and is it, I'm talking about getting the world round to that kind of sanity which is chiefly what we're trying to do. Well, in The Clash, that's what we're trying to angle our songs at, in order to get people to think or at least discuss topics that relate to reality such as this. And that's what we're trying to do, but we ain't gonna do it without any help. And we're not getting and a lot of help from, we can't rely on the media. The newspapers are all right wing here in America, all over Western Europe. It's just, you know, we're not getting any help. We need support from from and from other groups to to come up and say to raise the standards of of rock music, rock and roll music. To raise the standards of it. It's all overproduced, uh, cheap shots, uh, songs that aren't really songs. Nobody notices. They sell the same. They get become hits. Everybody's happy, the videos sell them, the magazines sell them, the record companies are happy, the accountants are happy, the lawyers are happy. I'm not happy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <coughs> well, you've got enough going at least not to feel disheartened though. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't feel disheartened because I wouldn't get out of bed in the morning if I felt disheartened. You know, I just feel that even my own audience, which is people who specifically know that The Clash are trying to make some kind of a change they're not afraid to admit that they're trying to make a change you know they haven't become totally cynical and jaded into going like let's just take the money and run you know even though the audience knows these things about the clash even i'd say 70 percent of that audience is still mostly unaware that we're we're anti-racist we're anti-fascist we're anti anti-capitalist even you know most of the audience is is just unaware they think they're just listening to another rock and roll band with a heavy heavy rhythm and 
some a nice load of noise, a nice row, you know. In Long Beach last week, our audience shouted at Malcolm McLaren, get off the stage, you nigger music lover. You know, uh, uh, watching Grandmaster Flash warm me up at one of our shows in Times Square four years ago, our audience shouted at him, uh, you dirty coon, get your stuff off the stage. You know, I, I'm, I, I'm, I have to face, this is my reality. I come from the most right-wing country in Europe, and I'm not used to handling that kind of thought. Many of my countrymen are out there now in the town thinking we're the cradle of democracy and the mother of parliaments and the guardians of free speech and all that. There is no free speech here. You ask any journalist who has to work down Fleet Street, you've got to be right-wing to hold down a job. And it's the same with, uh, I don't know, the same with probably the TV people. I don't know, you yeah. you deal with, with your own scene. You must know the ins and outs of it. But it's the same in America. They won't even play black music on the radio. Uh, the video channel MTV that's breaking a lot of bands and it's helped The Clash even uh, to a certain extent, even though we've done 99 tours there and played Milwaukee. And... You know, I speak to young Americans and they won't even believe it. You know, I have to present the evidence to them as if speaking to a, a three-year-old to get them to believe it. It's just, no one's doing any thinking. And this brings me around to another of our, our new scenes is, um, we're going to take the drug out of drug, you know. We're, we're going to take the Keith Richards out of drugs. It's not leather-trousered fashionable drug anymore. You know, Clash is now saying drugs is over. Drugs, drugs are grandfather's scene. Drugs are bell bottoms, cat bands. Admit it. Be a hippie and take drugs, but don't try and be modern and take drugs because drugs are finished. You know, drugs are for those old pop stars. Yeah. If if anything, I mean, you're you're right there. If anything, the Clash have always been uh, more or less on on Robin Hood side of things, but people because of maybe, I don't know why, have taken a very pessimistic view. Yeah, I think it, it's cool because I want a dialogue. I don't want a one-way worshipping trip like yeah. a heavy metal band. I want a dialogue. I want feedback. I want criticism. I can take it. We put ourselves up for it. You know, we raise the standard, so we expect to be flayed because um, we have fallen into every pitfall that you could possibly fall into as a group starting from nothing and becoming something. We fall into each and every pitfall and probably invented a few new ones along the way. And there is no way around these pitfalls. You just do not get issued with a map. And every young group that starts is going to fall into them. And I'm talking specifically like the success goes to your head pitfall, the ego trip pitfall, you think you're musicians, you think you're artists, you think you're geniuses, you become drug addicts, you, you make overindulgent records, you, you overproduce everything, you overdub the sound of ants biting through a wooden <laughs> beam. All these things, we've, we've gone through each and every damn one of them. We didn't even manage to shortcut one of them. And that's why we come out a depleted force, like Mick Jones, the Clash guitarist, we lost to artistic mania, I don't know. I had to beg him to play the guitar. It's insane, I can't stand that kind of, I've, I've got too much, you know, the Clash has got a job on. In, in in trying to attempt its ridiculous aims. You know, I'm proud that we've got ridiculous aims because at least we ain't going to underachieve. And we can't... I can't achieve these things if I have to beg the members of my band to play their instruments. You know, Mick Jones was the Clash guitar player, so I'm not going to walk around... I'm not going to walk around begging him to play the guitar. If he doesn't want to play the guitar, he can play a synthesizer. I don't care, let him get on with it, but best not to drag, it's like, it was like dragging a dead dog around on a bit of string, you know. How can you do anything or be anybody or, or try and live up to these ridiculous ideals when you're dragging a, a dead dog around on your back? It's insane. Better, better take a dive and never be heard of again than to carry on like in its ridiculous performance like that. You know, I'd rather go back to busking, be a nobody, than carry on like that. Well, I don't, I don't think that will happen. Well, you don't that. know, I'm prepared. Yeah, I'm ready to go. You know, and it's but very unfortunate, as you say, to have problems of 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 such like as as Mick. I mean, I once had a 
an interview with uh, with Keith Richards, and Keith said that guy is just too much. Who? About Mick. Oh yeah. Yeah, you know, that guy's just too much. I say he can pose like me, but and you know how Keith goes by the if he teases his hair like me. I mean, it's all right. It's a compliment, but that guy's just too much. And you know, so <laughs> even Keith was feeling uh, jealous. You know, and that's uh, if you really think about what he was saying there. Even Keith Richards was feeling the heat of a. Uh, see, when you get someone imitating you. That's really revealing because it shows how insecure Keith Richards is. Because if you're really secure, it would be a laugh. Uh, but uh, you you mentioned that it was unfortunate that we had to go through these things. But I think it's the wrong word. I think it's inevitable. Inevitable experience, in a way. Yeah, inevitable. I was trying to say that you don't get issued with a map you know, how to avoid these things. And in fact, you could even say that one person cannot tell another person. It has to be learned by sheer experience, you know, the, the actual pain of real experience. That's when you learn the lesson. Living it. I mean, I remember reading advice from, from pop stars, like, don't sign anything and stuff. But you have to sign something sometime. You see, like, we got a paradox, right? We set out, actually, we're sitting in this room here, and this room is a breeze block room built inside a larger room, and this, geographically, exactly where I'm sitting here, was where the clash started out, their first ever, we first ever played the tune together in this space. Where I'm sitting would have been the original place for the drum kit before, before this recording booth in this room was built in this larger warehouse or above us and around us, you know. And so it's been good rebuilding the clash here because we come really full circle all the way, you know, all seven years from starting here to coming back here now. And, and in a way, th there was no way of avoiding those things that we fell into. I think it's just a question of learning, being burnt by life and learning from it. Like, you can't tell a child not to stick his hand in the fire. But when he sticks his hand in the fire, he's got the message. But all the amount of telling him... Yeah, there was no, there was no chance for you not to take a calculate. Well, not, yeah, really. Oh, yeah, what I was saying... Risks, yeah, what I was saying was, in this place, seven years ago, we decided that we were going to be bigger than anybody else. But still keep my message you know we didn't see we couldn't see the the attraction of being pure in a closet somewhere you know like a lot of groups will like be pure and have ideals and stick to them and all this but they remain known to only about 20 people in a distant place and that's never attracted me that idea because that seems to me the easy way out you know what has to be done is somebody has to tell the whole world of young people who are tuned into rock and roll and rock and roll only somebody has to tell them that rebel rock is and can be number one it doesn't have to be a, a, an industry milk sop you know what I mean things are created by accountants and lawyers and Music is written almost by accountants and lawyers. Not literally, but near enough. Now, cults are, are, are created by accountants and lawyers and company men. And these things are, are nonsense and will just go by and be forgotten because it's not real. The real things that you can remember came off the street, invented by lunatics, madmen and, uh, and individuals, and they're the ones that last. I'm talking about your actual rock and roll, rockabilly, even psychedelic insanity rock and punk rock. These things weren't created by the industry. The industry was running after these things going, what is it? Where can I get some? Does anybody know where you can find some of this? Or does anybody know what it is? Does anybody know how we can sell it? Those things are the real things. And all this stuff that's like here in England, we try and build fads and cults and sew them up one every three weeks. 
It's all nonsense because it's created, fabricated. Nothing's given a chance to be real or grow. And the clash, we decided to, to that rebel rock must be number one. That it, we can't leave it to, to formula heavy metal music or the latest in grandmother's favorite toe-tapping tunes. You know, it's too feeble. It won't work. It doesn't mean anything to anybody. You know, it's the atomic age is upon us already. It's time to wake up and rebel rock must get through. And for every rebel rock record that gets through or every rebel rock band that goes through, there's a million young people checking that out who are learning to play and learning to sing and learning to write. And that's going to encourage them to be real, to be true. And we, the, the world needs more realness, more truth. You know, that is the most exciting and glamorous thing. I don't need drugs. I don't need uh, love songs. I don't need fake white soul. I don't need any of this chi she chic, chic, cleek, cleek stuff. It's all nonsense. What we need is, is a bit more truth and a bit more reality and a bit more madness, insanity, lunacy, spontaneity, individualism. It's been stamped out. You know, we go to school to learn how to be a good factory worker, not to learn any damn thing else. And the fact is you can't find any jobs, even if you've got a, a philosophy in, in the cultured arts. You can't even get a job stacking shelves in a supermarket. That just proves the point. Has your honesty ever hurt your sanity? Of course it has. It's just in a world that's built on 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 illusion. Advertising is illusion. What you see is what you get. I mean, this is one of the most magic formulas. This is the uh, this is the uh, the epitaph of the Western world. Uh, the obituary. What you saw was what you got. That's what's written on the gravestone of the Western world after the Holocaust, you know? It's just nonsense. I don't want to hear. In America, they, they, they've gone. I tell you, they're gone. You go to California. I'm talking about really simple, basic things. You touch a piece of wood. Wrong. This wood is not wood. This wood looks like wood. Synthetic. Yeah. You pick up a tomato and you bite it. Wrong. This looks like a tomato. This is a tomato, but this is not a tomato because it tastes of nothing. You know, if you close your eyes, the taste between a cucumber and a tomato and a lettuce in California, they're all identical. It, it, it looks like food. It feels like food. It is food, but it isn't food. You know, people smile at you. Wrong. They've been told by the management to smile at you. So really, you're not seeing anything that's real. Not the objects, the buildings, the signs. Everything is fake. The cars now are sort of plasticated metal. Is it metal? Who knows? Nobody knows. It's plastic. You know, nothing is real. And what they get, we will get later. And the if the world is moving towards that, then... I'm not interested. I like to come back here because here in London we have reality. You have people shoving you out of the way. And then you can go, that was a, 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 a gesture I can un is clear. This guy's in a bad mood and he shoved me out of the way. That is real communication. And in California, you wouldn't get it. He'll sue you. Yeah, he'll sue you or he'll <laughs> smile at you while he's thinking about shoving you out of the way. Either way, ni neither of it's communication, and this just adds to the nuclear war. But uh, what? So, so okay, we've, we've, you were talking earlier about uh, uh, the rebel rock, and, and what we need is people from the streets, which which is uh, have been which has been echoed in the past through people like uh, well, the big guys, you know, like Dylan, for instance people coming up from the road. So what do you do then, Joe? I mean, what are your plans? Do, do, you, do you flow with it? Do, do you go with it and, and end up as big and as uh, unreachable as the stones? No, what, no, what do, because, what do you do? no, because I try and break every rule in the book on the way, right? And nothing is going to stop me from going for the top because I'm not here to, to be a closet case group. 
congratulating itself in some in a squat out in the country you know I'm not in it for that I'm out here to break every rule in the book and that's why we talk to anybody who wants to talk to us after a show if they want to hang around give us time to change shower and 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 have a cigarette we'll talk to anybody who wants to wait around that long and I'm just you know we're touring without a record because we don't want to make a record because we're not ready to make a record we want to come out and say hey we're not ready to make a record instead of uh, the industry would have you just make a record doesn't matter if it's you know we'll we'll get some heavy producer in and paper over the cracks no one will be able to tell there's no quality control out there the people would take whatever they're given I mean I want to destroy that attitude I want the people to turn around and go boycott the record stores boycott the radio stations tell the people in charge that they're not having it you know I want that kind of attitude I want to foster that kind of attitude you know I, I don't need this give me a, a gut bucket guitar and a pair of shoes and you won't see me for dust you know but I've got the chance of doing something I've got an audience and I've got microphones pointed at me and I've got the outlets and I see this as a rare privilege a, a thing that I'm not gonna blow by becoming a drug addict by becoming an alcoholic by becoming an egomaniac by becoming an inflated um, ponce who ponces around thinking he's greater than he is what I do pretty much anybody can do but the fact is I'm the one who's doing it I'm the one who's got the microphone in front of my mouth and by instinct, by hook or by crook, I've got it that way and I'm not going to blow it. I want to break every rule in the book. And my main message is truth and reality makes things worth having. Not beating around the bush or pretending things aren't this what they this are. This seems to me like, okay, you, you, you're keeping off the drugs, yet all this responsibility and the things that you're talking it's quite heavy it's quite heavy in a way no i think that's a fallacy i think look you jump it's, up it's on too much too much to bear on your brain yes though. but look you jump a microphone with a huge pa of forty thousand watts point all those lights at me you know why are you saying that because you're calling that upon yourself no one's forcing you into doing that i've called it upon myself no one's twisting my arm and like, if you can't, you know, if you, you can't call all that up and then jump up on stage and say, oh, I can't handle it, the pressure is cracking me up. Get out the way. You know, it's in madness. If all these Hollywood stars, they go, oh, no, um, they pay people thousands of dollars a week to make them into big stars, and then they go, oh, the pressure, I can't handle it. I mean, get out the way, you know. There's hundreds of people out there in Nowheresville who'd give their right arm to be where everybody is. So it's hip to say, I can't handle yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> it's not. Get out of the way if you can't handle it. I mean, you really have to work to call this amount of attention well, on yourself. Well, this is what I was going to say. You do, you, do, you do obviously do lots of work. Oh, yeah. I work around the clock for it, you know. And I... Sometimes I think I'm going mad, what am I doing? But I realize that I spent two years in this room arguing with, with the rest of my group. And that's why we had to change the lineup because we were getting nowhere. And two years out of the scene, I expected something to be there when I got back. But there's nothing there. That's why I'm doing this because there's no one to take the weight, to pull pull the slack there isn't anyone I know with my example I will foster a thousand million groups I've already fostered 1,000 groups and I'm gonna foster a thousand million more and they will take the slack up when I'm useless for the task yes. is this why you uh, actually audition people are known, known people in the, it's the old pals act it's you know Keith Moon's dead get in Kenny Jones big deal it's the, old, the easy way out the good thing Look, you, they should have got in some mad... You interviewed your daughter and he said, I kept saying all along that Kenny's the wrong drummer for the band anyway. Of course he was. Uh, you know? Get some <laughs> lunatic off the street who's desperate, who wants to flay those drums like Keith Moon flayed them. You know, not some guy who's already got a mansion in Surrey and who's just content to tap it along in the right beat and get everything right and go home and count the wages. You know, that's why it didn't work. That's why they're bursting off around the world in another burst of energy, because they went took the easy way out. 
We all put an advert in the paper and we took all comers. And Nick Shepard and Vince White, the new guitar players, they realized you don't get an opportunity like this every Sunday. And they, they're not going to blow it because they realize that they're on the line. They're desperate men. How many did you audition? 350. And all of them were egomaniacs, apart from uh, about 10. Yeah, so um, out of 350, you've, you've, you've got your lineup now. You've obviously been trying it out, yes? I mean, you've been rehearsing. And we've, we've toured California. With it? Last week. Uh huh. Are you happy? Yeah, because it just means, like, see, in a group, you've got to have an atmosphere of say what you mean. Say what you think, and nobody takes it personal. That's the way to move forward. You can't have any sulking. You know, sulking is pop starism. And I in this. In this lineup, we got. There's people who want to get on with the job who can take anything. You know, you say what you mean and, and you get somewhere. I, I can't stand this sulking business. It's just ridiculous. It's like being in a group with a load of old women. I'm talking about the old clash. Mm. Do I detect that you, you, you obviously you feel felt hurt about it, right? Well, it's just it. Because I for, couldn't believe that we were honking we, for five years. Yeah, nothing. I couldn't believe that we turned into the people we were trying to destroy, which is obviously life's full of sick jokes, and you could have seen that one coming, I guess. But it's still of a shock when it actually happens. You know, we turned into a load of pop stars. The way I see the clash is like uh, the, the big noise that happened was obviously during the punk days and straight after the punk days. Then uh, the bigger noise happened in the States with, with, with the clash. It's not well, just a noise and then everybody's forgotten you for good, at least when you come back. Yeah, I'm, I'm conscious of... Um, I'm conscious of being present when I'm fit to be present, you know? And we we spent two years out because we weren't fit to be present. We were too busy t internally struggling. We had nothing to externalize. And I'm conscious that, that that's apt and fair, you know. If you've got nothing to say or you can't deal with, your, with, with what's to be dealt with, get out of the way in case there's someone coming through that wants, that has got something to say. And I just regret that nothing that I could, uh, I'd cross the road for came through. Are you happy with your past material? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's good stuff. I mean, a lot of it I'd change, do differently, or some of it goes on too long, it's too much overdubbed on stuff, some of it. You know, I prefer the first album to any of the others. There's things that I, I'd change now, but you've got to burn and learn, really. And you, I've learned. There's some gems on that album. and. Uh also even going back as far as saying as the 101 as even. Yeah, I mean, that wasn't a bad band, except they didn't want to go modern. They didn't want to reinvent themselves. That's the phrase. You've got to reinvent yourself, even constantly. Mm. And that's fun, but some people are sticking the mud and they, they think it's it, it's funny. They're satisfied with the way they are. So are you, are you now um, writing or what? Or attempting to write? What, what, what have you been doing since yeah we got a we got about 16 songs that we're playing in rotation live and I'm playing them because nothing scares the pants off a song more than playing it live you know it's one thing to rehearse it and go into a studio and record it but to rehearse it and then play it live to a hungry audience that knocks the stuffing out of a song that's where the the clash, I think, has always been really at, isn't it? There in front of people. Yeah, the and that, that, then you really know where your writing's going when you see an instant reaction. And that's why I'm glad we haven't recorded anything yet because we're changing the songs nightly. Mm. You know, this bit, throw it out. You know, we're being ruthless and tough with it. I don't think any of these pop stars and top 40 artists 
They've all got too many slaves and too many yes-men and too many sycophants around them. There's nobody telling them, that's a load of rubbish. Go back and do that again. Not, there's not enough of that. Like in the old days, like say Motown, the reason that Motown brought out so many great songs and so many great records is because there was a really heavy structure there. They wouldn't stand for any pop starism, right? Their writers, you know, they were just writers who were writing, and they came up with a duff song. The management would turn around and go, that's a duff song. And that's why only the good songs came through, and the, the singers, right, they realised they had to really sing it well, or, well, if you lot can't sing it, right, we'll give it to this lot here who's waiting in their hallway. You know, and there, there was that kind of lack of preciousness. It doesn't, what, it doesn't matter who played what. Yeah, but it was a lack of preciousness. Like, if you can't do it, We'll get somebody else. You know, and that made people really jive to it. And there's too much of this sur subservience to some pop idol who's had a couple of lucky hits. And, it, you know, you really should... Someone should go in and give him a good spanking, you know, every day just to bring him down to reality. Because just drivel, you know, even like... Even Boy George and everybody in the world falling over themselves saying how wonderful he can sing. He can't even begin to sing. You know, I don't even pretend I can sing, but he pretends he can. He can't even begin to sing. And half of his material should have been dumped before he was even thought of. But there isn't anybody around him going, this is rubbish. They're all worshipping him, going, yes, George, squeeze out a few more. We can make another uh, $40 million. Dollar. Sell, yeah, they don't mind the public. They'll take it. We'll dress it up, get you a new dress, a new, some, a new image. We'll get a nice video. Don't worry about it. We'll, over double load of stuff on it don't worry about it but really people should be telling him it's a load of nonsense you know I sit in that pub over the road and I hear some boy you know I don't keep up by these records because I got more sense but I hear these records coming over the radio or sometimes they play a few album tracks of his and it's just like the most it's like an audible Kleenex it's a, about as worthy as a Kleenex and somebody should be telling him Give over, you know, who are you fooling? You ain't fooling me. But there isn't anybody around these people saying being that hard. And like, what I like here is we've got that kind of, we've got that kind of attack on our own material where like, um, we're a team here. We've got the group, Bernard Rhodes and Cosmo Vinyl. And when we record a new number, we just demo it on a cassette or on the um, two track in here. Then we all sit around and go, Phew. Sounds like this, sounds like that. Ugh, you know, we give it the treatment. Dump it. Yeah. yeah, dump it. Don't be precious. Okay, so it took you four days to write. Dump it. Well, it's good because you don't feel bad about it. That yeah, no one takes it personal. Right. No sulking or pop star is. The majority of people, I think, nowadays do actually uh, feel insulted if somebody had to turn up to them and say, look, uh, I think you should have used a five letter word there. And so I mean, go, yeah, go back in history. That littered with the countless examples look bob dylan right like a rolling stone heavy song number one worldwide smash bob dylan was there the radical beat poet was there t to take the the jewel crown of pop and make the world something different and of course he came out with please crawl out my window, window. right which and I've read accounts of him playing it to his friends going, well, isn't it great? Don't you think it's great? This is my latest masterpiece. Isn't it great? And they were kind of going, mm, well, it's, uh, um, uh, shut up. It's great. And he wouldn't have it that it wasn't great. When if you just play like a Rolling Stone now and play Won't You Please Crawl Out Your Window, you can see that Won't You Please Crawl Out Your Window is a half-baked load of mishmash, nicht nach nothing. But how could boosted by the hope of mega superstardom, his mind was completely out to munch. And even now, if we got Bob Dylan in the room and played him, he'd go, yeah, I see what you mean. It's not that great after all. Even now he could see it, but at the time, it's at the time it matters. So you must have been fighting, well, I mean, what, what battles are you going through then, especially with the American companies? Look, they're Europe? just saying, look, how can you split up a million selling formula you and Mick Jones wrote Combat Rock, it sold a million, how can you, you know, and I'm just going, shove <laughs> off, you know, if you can't 
roll with the punches and go and re-sign Barbara Streisand or re-sign the Rolling Stones, which, well, they've already done that, but, you know, go and do something predictable because if they can't roll with the punches, then get out the way. You know, I'll sign with anybody. Just It's just a tool. A company's a tool. You know, if I make a great record, I want it around the world, in your shop, in Sydney, Australia, in Dartmouth, in Portsmouth, in Poughkeepsie, in Syracuse, you know, in Milwaukee, I'll, even in Lagos, you know, even in Venezuela. I want it in your local record store. And that's what a company is to me. It's a, a structure that would do that for me. And that's all I require from it. And more than anything else, you went out there to uh, actually report all this music to the people. Yeah. Instead of uh, just doing the, the obvious thing, which you could do is play a couple of uh, dates at Missing Quirk Gardens and then retire oh, for five years. Sure, sure. We c it, it doesn't work like that. You know, I've done stadium gigs. I've played to... I supported The Who playing to 90,000 people. And I just figured, like... This is nothing. This is nowhere. You know, I want to be bigger than than all of those groups, but I want to do it in a way that that means something somehow. You know, we'd rather play seven nights in a town than just one night in a big gaff. You know, I've played seventeen nights in one club in a row in New York, and that takes some reinventing yourself seventeen times without a day off. That takes some doing. How much do you admire the Stones? Well, I think they were great because they they took me back to blues. And well, when I was 12 years old, they led me to blues and rhythm and blues, the real thing. And that's what I think is the real thing. And all music comes from that. Mm. What I was going to say is that is it just a coincidence that your lineup happened to be the same as their lineup? as in the first place or did you want something specifically like that no even, well, even dropping the guitar now which are you are dropping the guitar aren't you well not really I, no. I, I play it now and then yeah I, I do I do play it you know I'm taking it with me tomorrow I've got it in a case over there uh -huh. I'm taking my uh, amplification too but we had five in the original clash Keith Levine Mick Jones me on guitar Simon on and, and, and chimes in the rhythm section and we have five originally we played quite a few shows like that so we're, we're just um you know I, I want to stop playing the guitar a bit to to be able to 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 go loopy and that's why we got a couple of guitar players so that the, the, the noise stays the noise but I, I do still play the guitar now and then because I'm playing a Fender and they're playing Gibson so we've worked out kind of three guitar mesh of sound I mean w so far we've heard what irks you or what's been troubling you but what 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 gives you the greatest thrills out of your little outfit that you've got or big outfit now mm. well I like it when we play something good I like it when we do a good gig you know I like it when when we come up with something good I, I like, work is more fun than work, somebody said. Noel Coward. I like working. Mm. I like feeling like, I get a kick out of it when somebody comes up to me and goes, because of your group, I went back and retook those exams I failed and passed them all. I get a kick out of that. I get a kick out of hearing how we influence people's lives to change. You I, know, I, 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 I get a kick out of people coming up to me and going, because of your group, I'm majoring in political science. You know, I get a lot of stuff like that. In other words, that you've, that you've had an achievement in some sort of area. Yeah, we've least, had yeah. an effect. Yes, yes. But I think one of them has been, like, you've actually influenced so many, many bands and going out there and actually playing... But there's still all these new so-called, all the new groups so-called who tried to replace the Clash, such as, I'd say there was three of them, Big Country, U2 and The Alarm. You know, we, we're trying to destroy Top of the Pops here because it's just, 
Well, leave it alone, really. Leave it for your mother and your grandmother to enjoy it. But let's have something that's a bit more dangerous, like a live show. Let's have a live show that goes out live, something that's a bit more dangerous. And we've been trying to destroy this program for seven years, and I'd say in exchange for this attempt to destroy it, we've forsaken being big here in our home country, which is quite a tough exchange, really. But none of these groups would back us up. You know, they they like to have the glory of being the new Clash or the glory of 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 doing our job, but they won't take the hardship that goes with it, such as being a watching some boring group like the Jam hit number one because they're on the on the, uh, the the boring old pop show that's why with the six million audience I mean we've forsaken that audience in order to one day it's, it's still this is a game of tennis that hasn't come to an end one day we will win the game alright alright Joe I'm going to have a piss and go on <laughs> <laughs>